When you were a boy, did you play much with girls or only with other boys? Let's see. Um, boys. Um, I used to get beat up a lot in, in grades one through three. It was like this late 60s, DC was on fire. Without the cooling influence of the American Gandhi, as he's been called, the riots could flare up with even more bitterness. You know, I remember walking into my mother's bedroom one morning going, this man named Martin Luther King's been assassinated. So I was watching morning cartoons and they, it was on the morning news. Indeed, it was Dr. King himself, shortly before his death, who said, the flashpoint of Negro rage is close at hand. That's when you'd go to school and a kid would walk up and punch you in the mouth. It's a black kid. Yeah. And I was like one of three white kids at this school. And so, you know, the kid would hit you and then all the other kids would go around you and go, fight, fight, nigger and a white. Beat him, nigger, beat him, because the white can't fight. That's right. And they'd all laugh and you'd piss your pants. And so you'd go and tell your dad about it. And that's when, like, fighting practice started. That's when the fight club started. And we go out on the front lawn. I go, like, I'm getting beat up at school. Well, no son of mine's gonna have a spade beat him up. And that's that. That was his operative word for black, either Marvin food stamp, or spade. Then to see if his teaching was good, he sicked me on the boys in his neighborhood. So I went up the street one day, to a boy who I am friends with. See him? I go, yeah. He goes, go give him zap, which means go hit him. And either I'm going to go hit Richie or I'm going to deal with my dad. So I knew what the, I knew what the choice was. I went in and Richie gets up. And he's like two years older than me. He goes like, hi. I'm like, hi. Wham! I take him out. And like he hits the ground and he's like, ah! And goes running inside to his dad, you know, to his parents. Because his friend just came up and whacked him one. And I came back out to the sidewalk. My dad was standing on the sidewalk laughing like Till like tears were falling out of his eyes, he thought it was so funny. He's there with a cigar, bent over, double, laughing. Using the scale, to what extent would you describe yourself as sympathetic? Uh, six, usually. Using the scale, to what extent are you sensitive to the needs of others? Uh, six, usually. In what circumstances would you use violence? To survive. This kind of response is, is fairly typical of somebody who, as a child, may have felt uh, that they were a victim. And as an adult, they may still continue to feel very persecuted, and they may feel very weak, very feeble, physically and mentally. So, parents, parents went, what do we do with this kid? A Bullis Naval Preparatory School for Boys. That'll fix his wagon. I'm like, whatever you say. And all of a sudden, I'm in this uniform. Terrifying. I'm an outsider. The screw-ups. Was, I was one of them. Not good at sports. Not good at school. We were the geeks. And we were often left alone until puberty. And then we were picked on. But before that, we were non-entities. Do you think it's important for men to be physically strong? Yes. We get a new teacher at school, teacher of Mediterranean history, uh, Vietnam veteran, real big muscles. He's the guy, you know, the, all the teachers wearing those bad, stretchy dress shirts from the day. He'd go like this, and the thing would stretch like a comic book character. I'm like, did you see that guy? And his nickname for me was, hey, little faggot. Nice guy. Hey, little faggot. Hey, oh, you're just teasing me, huh? Sit down, little faggot. Okay. And so one day he says, so look, little faggot, you're going to have your little mommy buy you a, a, a weight set at Sears. That was more attention that any male was paying to me. And a, a young boy should have a male figure in his life, a big brother, a father, somebody. Well, all I know is I wanted it. You know, I wanted a man to go, here's how it is without saying, you know, your mother's okay, I want you to respect her, but she's a spade lovers, lover, so don't take her too seriously, like wisdom from dad. So it was cool for a guy, even though he's kind of harsh, abusing, you know, teasing me, 
he was paying attention to me and it went a long way with me. And so I'm lifting and all of a sudden I'm throwing on two and a half. So I need five more pounds. I need five more every week. I'm making my little progress on the way thing. I'm watching my lifts go up. And it's not like I'm Charles Atlas or anything, but I had a physique. It was probably the pivotal moment of my youth where I went, oh, okay, I'm capable of something. And so it's not as if my self-esteem shot through the roof, but I came aware of, of what, that one can have some. If you had to live as one of these people, who would you rather be? Gandhi, Einstein, Bill Gates, John Lennon, or Muhammad Ali? Uh, just because I like Muhammad Ali, doesn't, I don't know if I'd want to live like him. Um, wow, that's great. I, if I were a woman, I would want a man. I would want a man who would listen to me, not hit me, be smart, know about poetry and literature, not be like this guy who's knuckle scraping the ground, some drooling Neanderthal. I, I'd want a, a, an articulate, sensitive man who could whoop that ass. Einstein hung out with a bunch of intellectuals all the time. John Lennon got shot in the head and had a crazy wife. Uh, Bill Gates, uh, and he dicks around with computers too much. I'm not interested in the pseudo-intellectual man who can quote Proust, who's, who has soft hands, and when the, when the heavy stuff comes down, he's gonna be, but Plutonius said. Who, who did we, we have Muhammad Ali and Gandhi? Okay. He drank his own piss. I have to go with Muhammad Ali. Brave, articulate, at the end of the day, loves humanity, tremendous athlete, which I'm not, but what a man, you know? He said it, he walked it, he talked it, he took, he was black, he said this stuff in the 60s. Why he didn't get what Martin Luther King got, I have no idea. Maybe he commanded even respect amongst the people who hated him. Using the scale, to what extent do you have a strong personality? Seven, always. Using the scale, how aggressive are you? Uh, well, this is frequency. For me, it's function. When the going gets rough, get rough. So when the, when the occasion arises, I'll do what I need to do to get through. Can you give it a score? Occasionally, four. When I was younger, there'd be all these young guys running up to get their piece of me. You think you're bad, huh? Let's go. I'm like... How often are you gentle? Four, occasionally. And so I'd have to get out of a lot of fights because these guys have to prove themselves. I'm, I'm the yardstick, and I don't want to be a yardstick. My face just can't take it. And uh, so I'd have to, like, kind of defuse the bomb. And I'd go, oh, yeah? I, I don't have the, the, the thing for that. Sometimes you couldn't get out of it. So through the 80s and into a few years into the 90s, I got in a lot of fist fights here and there, many different countries. What do you hate most about men? All that stuff. The guy who punches the woman out and all that macho stuff without any articulation, just like the tough guy thing, without any mind behind it. Here we go, here we go, here we go. All the lad thing turns me off. So much of it I see here in England just, just bums me out. Using the scale, to what extent would you describe yourself as a lover of children? Using the scale? Oh, seven, always. I mean, is there any part of you that would love to be a dad at all? No. No, I love kids. They drive me nuts. I love them. Can you imagine being perfectly happy to give up your career to look after kids? If I had kids, I would want to make sure I was there to so they wouldn't know who this weird guy was coming in every once in a while.
and I might not be happy giving up the career, but I would not mess up a kid by being this stranger. I couldn't do that to someone else. And I don't like, okay, we're gonna go to the airport now, get the child carrier, the bags. I see these parents with one little infant and all this stuff. Like, what is it, a film crew? They're like loaded down with, with Sherpa guides, getting them to the plane. I'm like, man, I like my backpack, a cup of coffee, and my itinerary and my passport, and I'm out of here. The test results show that Henry Rollins falls into a category known as the self-explorer, but he's also an experimentalist. And that's true of about 15% of us. It means that he's a maverick, an individualist, a loner, but also somebody who's at odds with public morality. He has his own morality, which is often contradicting the official view of life, if you like. He's constantly seeking stimulation, and that also means that he's constantly being frustrated. But luckily for him, as these people get older, they tend to seek stimulation less, and so they tend to be less frustrated. Do you ever worry that being a man is not a good thing? What choice do I have? You know? Henry Rollins on, the, on, on this test actually scores more on the femininity side than on the masculinity side. His, his male score is actually 67% and his female score is 73%, uh, which might seem very odd, but in fact what the test is testing is self-perception. So the way he sees himself is as a nurturant, loving, caring, all the stereotypically female things, but the way he comes across is extremely masculine. So his public image contradicts his private image. And of course, that's true of all of us to a large degree. The way we see ourselves and how other people see us do not often go inside. Thanks. See you. Good night. See you. And again, I'll lie again and again, and I'll keep lying, I promise.